We are at the top of the hour. Does anyone want to volunteer to start us off with a prayer? If not, I'm going to make Jeff do it. I'll be glad to. Oh, thank you. Father, we're privileged to have this family that has found the fifth epical revelation. And we're privileged now to enjoy each other's company and to learn from each of 24 presenters as much or as, as little as we can be present for over the next 24 hours. We pray for your spirit of truth to pervade these 24 hours. We pray for your love to remain in our hearts, to constantly remind us of you, that we may be reminded that we are brothers and sisters together. And what a privilege we have to be so conscious of that, to be conscious of this without barriers, knowing that there are no other requirements only that we love you and by loving you, learn to love each other more and more. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together. Amen. 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 David, can you stop share for just a second so I can uh, see people for a couple introductions and announcements? Thank you, sir. Certainly. Well, welcome back, everybody, to yet another 24-hour event. Um, I am so excited to have this event happen again. The first one was amazing. Uh, Margie Ray was the winner and that she's the only one who stayed up for the entire 24 hours and uh, witnessed it all. But many more people have witnessed it as it's lived on on Facebook and on YouTube. And so this is the first reminder that everything that's happening right now is being recorded. And so if you do not want your faces uh, or voices included in this recording, please either turn off your camera or switch over to Facebook where you can watch it uh, live without having to interact or have your screen involved. Um, that said, we have an amazing 24 hours ahead of us. Thank you all for coming. It's been an honor to help organize this. And frankly, it has been a complete joy and that this 24 hours we've been joined, the association's been joined by the education committees of both the fellowship and the foundation, as well as Urantia University to bring you this program. Um, so a few reminders for all 64 of us. Uh, please mute yourself if you are not speaking. We will try to mute you your, ourselves um, as you're going, but try to mute, mute yourself. If you have something to say, please raise your digital hand. Um, on different displays, your digital hand is in different places, but either somewhere in your controls or if you push the participants tab, you will see a raise hand icon. And if you have something to say, raise your digital hand and you will be called on in order. If you can't figure that out, just start waving your hands real good and we'll try to find you. But um, there are a lot of people, and so we may not see you if you're just waving your hands frantically. There is a chat room you're welcome to use. Um, try to remember the difference between sending a group chat to everyone and sending a private chat to an individual. Try not to confuse those. Um, use headphones if you can to improve your sound quality if you have an echoing problem. Do not type while your microphone is live because we don't want to hear the clickety clacks. And as I said, this session is going to be used for future study purposes. So it will go onto the internet and it will just live there forever. So uh, try not to do anything that you don't want future generations to come back and later view. That said, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, about 24 hours from now, we'll hopefully be able to sign off at the end of a successful event. Our very first presenter kicking it off is Mr. David Kulicki. David's the education chair for the Urantia Book Fellowship. He is a third generation reader. 
who joined your, uh, the first Urantia Society in 1973 and is its current president. He's an English and music teacher. He also is a tutor uh, and he teaches students in China, both online and in, David, you'll have to say the word. Xinjiang. Yes. That <coughs> he lives in Lincolnshire, Illinois with his wife, Marilyn, who is active in okay. the Revelation and does workshops around the country with David. The, together they have three children, five grandchildren, and two golden uh, retrievers. Everyone, <laughs> it's an honor to introduce Mr. David Kulicki. Take it away. I didn't know we had golden receivers, but that sounds, uh, it sounds profitable. The title of uh, this presentation is The Affirmations of a Friendly Universe. Uh, it is a shortened version of something that uh, Matab Tirani, um, who is one of my best friends and on the education committee I chair, and I did in 2018 um, when the topic for the summer study sessions was um, it's a friendly universe. Um, before I get off, um, I wonder if that's Chris on that mountain there. Uh, since the topic is a friendly universe, uh, I, I just want to point out how um, positive and friendly and uh, reinforcing it has been to be a part of the education community in the Rancho movement. We have done many workshops together we, um, with, with Guard and people from UUI and people from UBIS and other places, and we've We've presented together and uh, well past a dozen now in the last few years. And Chris and I, together with other people, serve on another education venture that we're trying to get off the ground. Um, much like a, a plane with no motor is trying to get off the ground, but we're trying. This is a topic that as soon as it was suggested that we use it for a theme, uh, I felt uh, a, a strong resonance to it because I think this is one of the really key ideas in the Arantia book that gives us a, an emotional and spiritual benefit and boost that not everything uh, does necessarily. Uh, Matab and I, I told her if there's anything you like that I would say that uh, it was her idea. Um, both feel that this just completely alters your perspective. If you know that what's next is good and you're headed there, it doesn't just make you feel more optimistic. It makes you feel that every moment and every decision and every step matters. So um, that, that's much of what I want to get across. Uh, we have 50 minutes. And, and as I said, this was originally two hours. So I've been condensing and condensing. And I'm going to uh, pause twice, once halfway through and once at the end for comments. And then at one point um, very soon, just to have you maybe jot some ideas down so that you'll be in, involved with those, what we're talking about. Okay, so that doesn't do it. There we go. I don't know how that worked, but I'm on, I'm on uh, Zoom all the time because of the classes I teach. So if you can just all think like a, uh, adolescent um, Chinese student, then I'll be really comfortable, okay? So our friendly and loving universe, why we can feel assured and confident of our eternal futures. This is the uh, little special logo we're using for our um, seminars now, and I just like it so much, I like to pull it up every time I can. That we live in a friendly universe and that this life is a prelude to, of what is to come makes every decision and experience have value. This awareness gives our entire material life in your ranch a meaning, even to its last moment. It adds savor and richness to all of our opportunities to serve, both here and throughout our eternal career. So if you could take about two to three minutes right now, if you have something to write on, Choose one of these questions and just put down some thoughts um, so that whether or whether or not you can uh, have a chance to share them, you'll, you'll be kind of um, 
invested in what's being said. How does knowing that we live in a friendly universe benefit our mortal lives? How should our, such knowledge affect our decisions, our actions, our spiritual attitudes? How might such knowledge inf influence our relationships? Knowing it's a friendly universe, just take a couple of minutes. And if you can't write, then think about it. Or Paul, you can write a poem. Do they have to raise their hand because everyone is muted? Well, I'm not going to be calling on people just yet until I get to a certain point. What I want you to do is kind of have these thoughts in your mind as we go forward so that some of the information and lots of quotes. I like lots of quotes. Um, I try to make them as relevant as I can. And Andre, I'm never sarcastic. I'm only ironic. <laughs> Paul, I'm expecting your poem to be an iambic pentameter. I'm an English teacher. OK, if you've got those questions in your head, hi, Marta, um, then perhaps they can serve as a little leavening for what we're going to be looking at here. So the first thing I'm going to do is make the case. The Arantia book assures us that we do live in a friendly universe. I am at, this is Jesus talking to Gainan. I am absolutely assured that the entire universe is friendly to me. I wasn't so sure in third grade, but he went, okay. This is all powerful truth. I insist on believing with a wholehearted trust in spite of all appearances to the contrary. It is, a, it is a friendly universe. The real universe is friendly to every child of the eternal God. When such spirit-led mortals realize the true meaning of this golden rule, they are filled to overflowing with the assurance of citizenship in a friendly universe, and their ideals of spirit reality are satisfied only when they love their fellows as Jesus loved us all, and that is the reality of the realization of the love of God. And there's more, but that should do it. So not only is the universe friendly, but the universal father is a loving and friendly God. Notwithstanding that God is an eternal power, a majestic presence, a transcendent ideal, and a glorious spirit, though he is all these and infinitely more, nonetheless, he is truly and everlastingly a perfect creator personality, a person who can know and be known, who can love and be loved, and one who can befriend us, while you can be known as other humans have been known as a friend of God. Man goes forth searching for a friend while that very friend lives within his own heart. And our master creator son, Michael of Nebadon is a loving friend. Uh, now here, I could have gone on for hours with the references that suggest this truth. Um, there's a really nice one I took out at the last minute about master sons feeling the same way we do because of his experiences and what he had done with them. But I thought these two, two were very nice. And by the way, I, 
when I'm doing an in-person workshop or when we have our two hour study groups now on Zoom, which I hope isn't forever, um, everybody reads and everybody contributes, but this is a little bit of a different forum. So let me get used to it. He left this world ripe in the experience which his creatures passed through the short and strenuous years of their first life, the life in the flesh. And all this human experience is an eternal possession of the universe sovereign. He is our understanding brother, sympathetic friend, experienced sovereign, and merciful father. When Michael, this, this really moves me, this, this, well, they all do, but th this one really moves me a lot. When Michael returned from this Marancha bestowal, that would be the Marancha bestowal after he was on Urantia, <clears throat> it was apparent to all of us that our creator had become a fellow creature, that the universe sovereign was also the friend and sympathetic helper of even the lowest form of creative intelligence in his realms. We had noticed this progressive acquirement of the creature's viewpoint in universe administration before this, but it became more apparent after the completion of the Marancha mortal bestowal, even still more so after his return from the career of the carpenter's son on Urantia. So you remember that the primary purpose that a Michael has in coming to a planet like this, the last of seven bestowals, is to experience what is it like to be one of his creatures and to take empathy to the empathy degree. Or maybe if, if you're familiar with Heinlein, uh, and when many of us were reading Heinlein in the 60s, uh, the word grok became very popular, which means more than just empathizing, but experience with, with somebody. Michael did that. And to me, uh, this is probably almost a fulcrum of what is wonderful and friendly and loving about the Arantia book, that our creator wants to know what it's like to be us. So at this point, uh, let's take a few minutes if there's any comments. There's chats. My partner with my Chinese uh, students has d disabled chat. I can't imagine why. I don't see any hands. I can see all of you. I have two big screens and. Mark Kurtz. Mark? Yeah, David, uh, as you were talking um, and you were emphasizing Marantia Jesus after return from his Marantia career, I think it would have been beautiful for us to get an idea of what he was saying while he was still here to the many different celestial beings that were visiting Urantia at the time. He probably had a marvelous, friendly experience while he was talking to different orders of celestial beings and they were seeing him and perhaps in a new way what your thought that you make here is beneficial i think that's a wonderful thought i'm sure he enjoyed every moment of that even if it was a little comp compressed they took him through the whole <laughs> gamut in just a couple months that's that's a that's a very nice point and you know um something that occurs to me after you say that is that um, there's all the different creatures and uh, personalities he created that he met on his way down the seven bestowals that now as he meets them going the other direction I'm sure it was much richer from that point of view too. Okay, am, am I calling in people then? Okay. So let me see, who are the hands? John Hales is next. Oh, good. Yeah. I know him. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, I'm John Hales. I'm from a little town, village called Kenilworth, uh, just north of Chicago. 
the first question, uh, David, you put up was, uh, how did the knowledge of a friendly universe affect uh, my mortal existence? Well, it was really quite profound in that uh, I came to realize there are no strangers. Uh, there's just uh, brothers and sisters I haven't met yet. Hmm. Although some people you meet seem strange, but that's a different question entirely. Okay. But, you know, it, it's just having that, that attitude uh, made it possible for, I used to be a shy person. I really, I really was. And gradually when I, that became a reality for me, I said, well, I, I really can talk to anybody because uh, we're related. <laughs> so anyway, that's my piece. Okay. Gail? Hi, I'm Gail from Austin, Texas. And what has struck me about the mention of Michael's bestowal on Urantia is that we are about, and, and that includes me, we are really one of the lowest creatures of the universe. We're way out there on the outer edges of the far flung universe just before going into the outer space areas and uh, <clears throat> so that's what I've always thought was really poignant about that whole mention is that and also it corresponds with if God is the highest and at the center then Michael bestowed himself at the lowest and at the farthest out from that center and that just reaffirms that uh, ascenders go inward and the descenders go outward. And that's just my observation for the moment. So let me mute myself. Thank you. Yes, we is, we're the furthest you can start and still reach perfection, which gives us an opportunity that nobody else in the universe has. And um, since we're overachievers, we were born in Urantia to make it even further. Marta? Or no, it's Kurt. Kurt and then Marta. Hey, David. I was wondering if you could stop sharing the screen so then we could see the people that are talking. Okay. Uh, the thing that I really like about this topic is how what a contrast it was from what I grew up in. It's so refreshing and liberating for me reading the Urantia book as opposed to the world that I grew up in, which was this hellfire and brimstone version of Catholicism, where, you know, God was out to get me for the slightest little thing. I lived in a, a family that was kind of violent and had an alcoholic father. And the world was not a friendly place at all for me. And the liberation that's come from that and the beauty and just the, it just, fills my soul with love to be able to have this revelation change that whole past that I grew up in and that a lot of us did. That's all. Thank you. Okay, I've got Marta and then Jim, and then I'm gonna um, go back to the screen and we'll have another chance for people to say things at the end. Marta? Um, well, I'm just really piggybacking on Kurt and, and John. I mean, my sense is a friendly universe changes everything. Because if it is a friendly universe, you don't have to be afraid. And fear is such a dominating um, emotion on this planet that, uh, you know, I almost can't even imagine what it would be like if, if fear were not the, the controlling factor that it is. But I see the difference in my work. Um, I'm sorry, people. I'm Marta Elders from Connecticut. And I happen to be a uh, psychologist. And so I really do see where Kurt was just talking. I see the difference between individuals who've grown up in a family that, that really was a friendly universe as opposed to one that wasn't. And the, the challenge it is to, to live when you do not believe it's a friendly universe. So my sense is for all three of those questions, knowing that changes everything. Thank you, Marta. Jim? Yeah, my name is Jim, Jim Shambaugh from Philadelphia area. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest though, and maybe uh, what I get the most out of this, uh, knowing it's a friendly universe, 
it's uh, I have no more excuses not to be friendly. <laughs> Truly, uh, um, maybe I could be growing up in a small town in Iowa that we were friendly to one another. And I'm living in Philadelphia, and that isn't necessarily the case on the street there. But I still do uh, share, try to share my love with people as I meet them and be friendly the best I can. And uh, as, uh, I'm so glad to be able to be here tonight. So uh, uh, keep up the good work. Well, I'd like to affirm to you that you seem very friendly. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right. So we've seen that the universe is friendly. God's friendly. Michael's friendly. Um, one of the things that I think is going to make all of that come true is that we're going to be running into friendly personalities all the way through, um, especially if we're friendly ourselves, like Jim. In fact, apparently, Albert Einstein was friendly because he said the universe is a friendly place. And I'm pretty darn sure that he didn't have the Arantia book because he died the year it was published, which is not entirely relevant, but it seemed like too good a coincidence to pass up. So I'd just like to say our ascendant sojourn through the universe is redolent of loving and friendly relationships from our beginnings as a mortal will creature all the way to paradise. Um, now, if, you, if you're familiar with the personalities of the grand universe, you know I can't show how we're friendly with each and every one of them. So we're just going to take a few on the way by as samplings to show this. To appreciate the love and friendship available to us while in Urantia, Jesus wants us to be loving friends ourselves, and he showed us how. And again, there are... Um, it, it's really kind of amazing if you look up friend and friendship uh, in the context of Jesus, how many times that is not just how he's referred to in passing, but one of the primary things about Jesus. He was a friend to people, and the apostles felt he was a friend, and people who didn't know him pretty soon felt he was a friend. Um, this is a picture of the boy who was afraid probably because he was dressed differently from everybody else. Nothing ever seemed so important to Jesus as the individual human who chanced to be in his immediate presence. That person who was in his immediate presence, I think that is a powerful statement right there. He was master and teacher, but he was more. He was also a friend and neighbor, an understanding comrade. So if we just take that or the other 500 bits of advice we get for how to be a friend by looking at um, how Jesus did it, we will undoubtedly be able to avail ourselves of friendships wherever we go. Throughout the whole, okay, this is this, another step, but it starts here. Throughout the whole mortal adventure of finding God and achieving divine perfection, the spirit ministers of seraphic completion, together with the faithful ministering spirits of time, are always and forever your true friends and unfailing helpers, our seraphic com companions. And it won't just be here, it'll be throughout uh, quite a bit of our experience. So the next one is the Marantia Companions which I think as we were talking about, probably is uh, reflective of some very good friends that Jesus made there. The Marantia Companions are such friendly associates that when you finally leave the last phase of the Marantia experience, as you're prepared to embark upon the super universe spirit adventure, you will truly regret that these companionable creatures cannot accompany you, but they serve exclusively in the local universe. Uh, universes. At every stage of the ascending career, all contactable personalities will be friendly and companionable, companionable, but not until you meet the paradise companions 
where you find another group so devoted to friendship and companionship. Good idea, since that's where we're going to be the most uh, disoriented, probably. But we can still look forward to others as we go along. A big skip here from um, the local system to Havona, but you know, can't do them all. During your long sojourn on the billion worlds of Havona culture, you will develop an eternal friendship for these superb beings. And how deep is that friendship which grows up between the lowest personal creature from the worlds of space and these high personal beings native to the perfect spheres of that central universe? So fill, fill in the gaps in between those uh, different outposts as we go along and just assume. <laughs> um, it's a nice background you have, Sherry. <laughs> I just caught that. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll put it down later and you'll have to check this out. Okay. Um, so now, now we're going to get uh, more to some of the differences between how we are going to view things after having the wonderful words of the Arantia book and how we know that these experiences will be looking. Uh, we can look forward to. But right now, you know, they say that uh, the world that you're on now is the most important one. You're going to prepare for what's coming. Um, but right now, this is the one that we, we need to focus on. One of the greatest gifts we receive from knowing that we live in a friendly and progressive universe is that while we are still mortal, our decisions, our daily experiences, our growth and our relationships are meaningful, real, and forward thinking today. It makes our lives as we grow older a prelude, not an end. Everything we do to the last minute we are here can matter as we look forward. Um, and, and to me, this is the most uh, appealing and poignant and meaningful aspect of this concept to me. It, it's not only how it makes us feel better um, and is able to fill in for the negative things that we might naturally experience. To me, it's that it makes everything we do positive and meaningful and mattering right up, right up to the end. I don't know if my um, daughter is in here someplace or another, but um, she's an English teacher too. And both my daughters, when I said about 10 years ago, after I'd retired from the classroom, but I was still doing a lot of other things, I said, you know, I think I want to go back. I, I have a master's, but I don't have a PhD. And get my PhD. And they looked at me and they said, well, why would you want to do that? You just retired. You don't have any need to do something like that. Um, and the whole point is that if I started it and I got halfway through and I died then, it wouldn't matter because everything that I had done at that point would be of meaning. Um, so all of us, um, whether our joints are working well or not because we played all those round ball sports 50 years ago, um, not that I'm getting personal here or anything like that, can still keep on growing and learning and making every day count. And that makes what we do and what we're doing right at this moment um, valuable, meaningful. So I, I, I want to look at these. Now, I will start out by acknowledging that um, I don't know as much about this as a lot of people here, like Marta, for instance, and Paul, I'm sure, and other people. Um, but this is one of my favorite <laughs> developmental psychologists. I guess that's a fairly limited group to be a favorite of. Uh, the other thing I was thinking about doing tonight was uh, a condensation of something that Marilyn and I have done that I think is so important in the Arantia book, comparing the theories of developmental psychologists with about the thousand different um, multi-stage growth patterns that are described in the Arantia book. And since the Arantia book came out before this was a popular uh, part of psychology, it's kind of amazing how well they, they mesh. But this guy I really like. Um, 
not necessarily every detail, but but the basic concept he had. He's one, one of the foremost full life developmental psychologists. Um, but I'm bringing it up to show where I think he got off. So he was an American psychoanalyst from Germany um, whose parents apparently suffered from a, a tremendous loss of imagination when they were giving him a name. But besides that, he emigrated to the United States in 1933, good for him. Um, Erickson taught at Harvard, engaged, engaged in a variety of clinical work, widening the scope of psychoanalytic theory to take greater account of social, cultural, and other environmental factors. In 1950, he divided the human life cycle into eight psychosocial stages of development. So I'm not gonna go deeply into this, but I, I think whether he got the exact age right, whether he got the right task that he talked about each stage has having to address, um, the theory to me it really makes a lot of sense. So during infancy, it, a big issue is uh, trust versus mistrust. And toddler stage, it's getting control over one's physical skills and a sense of independence uh, on, a, on a physical level, um, leading to autonomy and some other things. Um, a child from three to five is asserting control and power now more over the external environment. So there's a sense of purpose. Children of six to 11 have to cope with new social and academic demands. And if they don't, uh, competence is a major task that they have to deal with. Teens are developing a sense of self and personal identity. And um, for the more I teach teens and the more we read books where it's relevant, the more this one, I think he really, he really nailed. I, I use this in, teaching um, Catcher in the Rye because I think you, you can understand what is happening with the Holden Caulfield by using this theory of, of um, psychological development. Um, teens are trying to become independent and they're pushing away. And a weak sense of self like Holden had is a problem. Uh, young adults need to learn to form intimate loving relationships. And so loneliness and isolation is an issue. Older adults, need to create or nurture things that will outlast them. Could be through children or other things that they've contributed. Now, it's stage eight that I find very interesting. And he's not the only one to do this. There's a lot of people who do this both in science and in literature. Older adults need to look back in life and feel a sense of fulfillment. Otherwise, they will have regret, bitterness, and despair. So the key thing here is the idea that the last stage of life means looking back, looking back. And that's what we know is not true. It doesn't mean you don't partially look back. You learn from experience. You remember things. You have experiences that you bring forward and memories that are um, important. But you also look forward. And that's the whole fundamental difference in having what the Arantia book is teaching us about what is next, the fact that we can count on going forward to a friendly, supportive, nurturing atmosphere and keep on growing. So anything we learn now is going to still be important if it's a value and of, of, of significance to stay with us. And I'm just using um, Erickson because I think he is so good to show how common it is for people not to understand that last stage. Despite his brilliant work, he missed a main truth. The last stage of life, indeed all stages, are not only about living this life fully, but also growing in preparation for continued life. If I die tomorrow, the decisions, valuable experiences, learning, and relationships of today matter. A fully realized life continues to look forward. A fully realized life is a, is a concept I'm always bringing into what I'm teaching in literature. Um, besides bootlegging a lot of stuff from the Arantia book. Oh, people don't like bootlegging. Um, okay, I'll, I'll make that more gentle, uh, stealing. Paraphrasing. You'd be amazed, and this is another thing, my cousin Lynn and I did this at one point. You'd be amazed how much great literature and pretty good literature deals 
completely on target with what is in the Arantia book. The themes, and I can just, uh, one of them is decisions, 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 and sincerity. The turning points in a protagonist's life are decisions. Um, another is the whole idea of personality integration. That's the, uh, that's the topic Marilyn and I have been barnstorming with all year, and we're going to do it on, online. Um, we're going to be virtually in Kansas City on May 30th doing that. Absolutely the core of our Marantia experience, I think, personality integration. Um, but if you look at literature, you see that's, again, it's either happening or it's not. So these next few quotes have to do with the fact that at every step of the way in living a fully realized, a fully fulfilled life, um, it matters. What, where we're going matters. So from paper 117, man's evolution does in some ways resemble the growth of the supreme. Man consciously grows from the material toward the spiritual by the strength, power, persistency of his own decisions. Uh, wait a minute, I wanted to go back to that. Decisions. So our decisions, when we're young, when we're middle-aged, when we're old, they matter. We grow through our decisions. Service, I hear the Dalai Lama is friendly too. Service, purposeful service, not slavery, is productive of the highest satisfaction and is expressive of the divinest dignity. Service, more service, increased service, difficult service, adventurous service, and at last, divine and perfect service is the goal of time and the destination of space. And that includes now. This is how we grow, and these are the experiences I think we'll remember. I just found this picture today. This is a highly respected educator from California. I know nothing else about her, but I just thought the picture was nice. So what I did is I built the whole presentation around this photo. Anyway, this is about education and growth and progress. The purpose of all education should be to foster and further the supreme purpose of life, the development of a majestic and well-balanced personality. Well, that's a good one. I think she has one. Although we have to remember, we're all cosmic zygotes. And finally, relationships. The souls of, oh, this, this is about people in light and life. And I just think the way it's set up makes the end of this, um, this statement really interesting. The souls of these progressing mortals are increasingly filled with faith, hope, and assurance. The spirit permeating those gathered around the translation shrine resembles that of, a jo of the joyful friends and relatives who might assemble at a graduation, excuse me, at a graduating exercise for one of their group, or who might come together to witness the conferring of some great honor upon one of their number. And it would be decidedly helpful if less advanced mortals, that's us, could only learn to view natural death with something of this same cheerfulness and lightheartedness. Now, I will say that there were so many Kulikis and Stevens and other assorted and miscellaneous relatives that had funerals that I either presided over or just attended. It was a different, it was a different feel than other funerals I went to. So it does have some effect, but I think we're, we're going to have to accept the mantle of being less advanced mortals at this point. So the point is the positive approach one has to life now because we know that life next is even better and that the place we'll be going will be friendly. So to close my comments and then give a chance for everybody to say things that are, are of real wisdom, let me read three last quotes. There is a great and glorious purpose in the march of the universes through space. All of your mortal struggling is not in vain. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I skip one. Hold on. Here we go. The self has surrendered to the intriguing drive of an all-encompassing motivation, which imposes heightened self-discipline, lessens emotional conflict, and makes mortal life truly worth living. And then finally, this is one that uh, I'm sure many people have read many times, but it's a nice way to finish here. Having started out on the way of life everlasting, having accepted the assignment and received your orders to advance, do not fear the dangers of human forgetfulness and mortal inconstancy. Do not be troubled with doubts of failure or by perplexing confusion. Do not falter and question your status and standing. For in every dark hour, at every crossroad in the forward struggle, the spirit of truth will always speak, saying, this is the way. So now let's hear you. I know Doreen was first because she raised her hand, I think, on Tuesday. <laughs> oh, Doreen? Thank, you. thank you, David. Thank um, you, Doreen. It's a pleasure to be here. I mean, I love this topic because when I read it in the Arantia book, I said, let me test it out. And <laughs> I went out there and I just found like Jesus did as he passed by looking for something nice to say to people or asking them if they need help. And I tell you, I, I've had hundreds of experiences. The thing is, you have to not be self-conscious. Forget yourself. Be interested in someone else. And the stories they told me and shared their lives with me, total strangers, it is so enriching, you know, to have that experience and, and to carry that and to know this is also, you know, a personality that God has gifted, my brother, sister, and it didn't matter because people really do respond positively and happy to do so. It's just, they're very difficult to initiate. And that, but one to, I even started a social club in my building because it was new. And so I wanted to bring people together. But one time I'm walking in the street, and I'll quickly tell you this, and there's a young girl standing a block away and I see this big smile and I wasn't wearing my glasses and she was waving to me and I said, oh, here is so-and-so from Dubai. She moved away last year. And I got close to her and grabbed her and we hugged and she looked at me and I looked at her, who are you? And it was the wrong person. And I said, oh, it doesn't matter. She's soliciting for Syrian refugees. But it was just wonderful. Doesn't matter. Thank you. Now, now, Doreen, I think everything you said should be taken to heart for, by each one of us, but we, we have to recognize that we're not all gifted as you are in getting people to tell their, spill their guts, um, or as nearsighted as you are, either one of which seems to be a, a, an advantage. But I'm really glad you brought up as Jesus passed by because I think that is one of the ways that we can all can contribute um, in an enormously wonderful way, probably not as well as you do, but still, I, I've been saying this, Marilyn knows this, I've been saying this for a long time. And we did a, um, a joint, see, another joint education workshop, there's about a half dozen people here who were there uh, three years ago. And I mean, I organized it, so I, I, I had three levels of teaching vis-a-vis -vis the Arantia book. Um, the first was, I think it was called teaching to the choir. In other words, doing what we're doing right now. People who have the Arantia book and we're talking about it and trying to dig a little deeper into the Arantia book. The third one though is as we pass by. Because if you bring with you the values that we're learning and growing and improving in, I hope, even if it's a 30 second encounter, you can do something that spreads a little bit of something in between. The, the the topic of the of the seminar was um, teaching the teachings of the book without necessarily giving somebody the book and knowing it well enough that you can do that. But at any rate, that as Jesus passed by, I think is absolutely relevant here. So thank you. Uh, how do I say Ranji? 
Yeah, you said correct. <laughs> it is uh, uh, Renji Matthew. I am in New York. I am an engineer with um, chief engineer at the mil U.S. Military Academy. Lives at the Hudson Valley, and I am from India. So you have my background. So I'm very glad that I could able to find my brothers and sisters. I could never be able to connect with the Eurasian community physically like what we are doing now. And David, thank you so much for your initial presentation. I have a question. We talked about a lot of terrestrial things, but the subject is about the friendly universe, which means let us think about an extraterrestrial friendship. When you say friend means somebody who reach out to you. It's not like you have to find it. They come to you, they talk to you, and they give us help and guidance. Similarly, don't you think our father's universe is ever expanding and never ending? He has billions and trillions of celestial creatures. Don't you think they are trying to reach us even they say they are friendly? You mean other people cannot... like us, or do you mean pe uh, people like Seraphim and other angels? Yes, I mean that. I mean those people, you know, the, the uh, unnumbered, wonderful creatures of God, temperature creatures, or whatever it is. They are friendly. That's what we are. We are learning from Urantia. Mm -hmm. So they are trying, and why we cannot connect with them? I think you're absolutely right. I think the Seraphim will they tell us, love us to pieces. Um, I think they also are leaving spiritual handprints on their spiritual foreheads because of the things we do frequently. But they still love us. <clears throat> I have a out of control golden retriever who is loving and uh, high energy and kind of a uh, ahead of his years and he figures things out like how to open the doors and things like that and he's also but he's out of control and i think he's the canine equivalent of the planet urantia well i know at 8 55 um i have to turn it back to the powers that be i frequently when i see chris i i, I say the hello power that be um so is there is there another comment? I, I hope you've all been able to entertain each other on chat. I saw the numbers piling up there, but oh, there it is, David. Time is short, I'll be brief. Yeah, I, I, I kind of uh, chuckle when I go through and read um, uh, the sections in the Urantia book about uh, uh, our primitive past. And if you read that carefully, you kind of find out that right now, at the time when we received the Urantia book, they pretty much consider us in many respects primitive. We're, we're primitive. So I just find it amazing that we've got all this information in the Urantia book uh, that uh, it's putting us on the fast track to uh, the ages of light and life while we're still got one foot deeply in primitive culture. Um, so I think the I think it's an impressive to think. Don't fear. Just get out and do it, and um, do whatever you can. You know, um, that's it. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, that reminds me of a lot of conversations with uh, all of my primitive friends. Um, one of the interesting things about this planet is that we have such a range. And I remember sitting in the front window of uh, a restaurant down the street from 533 Diversity with someone and someone commenting, you know, if you sit here long enough, you'll see just about the entire spectrum of human beings walk, walk past. And I, I, there's some truth in that. Um, and I was at the end of the line. Okay, powers it be, it's yours. It's a singular power that be. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is your five minute break, everybody. Go get some coffee, visit the bathroom, be back in five minutes, all 103 of you. Be back here. Oh.
in uh, five minutes for our next presentation. Thank you, David. If anyone would like to talk, now's a good time. Ask questions. We'll cut you off when, uh, when it's time. We also want to thank the people who are watching on Facebook. Yes, thank you, Facebook.